So now what we're going to do is we're going to move on to some um, cases. And uh, these are designed to be quick and to the point to answer a lot of your questions. Okay, you know our distinguished panel already. And it, it's interesting how Miguel is so tall he doesn't even fit into his own picture. <laughs> so this is the format, okay? This, you're going to like this. There's a case details and then Steve or Miguel, I want to know what's your, t your grade A recommendation for therapy and why? What's your grade B and then what would you say D? Probably not. So we're going to do quick cases and they have different scenarios and you'll see what I mean. So the first one, a 25-year-old female, moderate severe Crohn's colitis who has an intermittent rectovaginal fistula, normal small bowel, normal upper GI, never had surgery, doesn't smoke, no EIMs, is only on ciprofloxacin and on exam, mild diffuse tenderness, and she does have a simple fistula that currently is not infected and, 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 uh, and no abscess. Steve, top choice therapy and why? Infliximab, uh, combination therapy with infliximab because it's fistulizing Crohn's disease and that's the most effective therapy. And certainly I would never minimize the impact on a woman's uh, uh, quality of life with a rectovaginal fistula. Miguel, any changes in your top choice, your A? Top choice, no change. Infliximab, and I would use azathioprine. Okay, so what about, what would be, Michelle, a reasonable option in, in, instead of infliximab with combo, combo therapy? So I think a reasonable option are there some data with use of kimumab? I would probably consider that. And then another reasonable option, which is a bit outside the box and more research, is if she were in the ability to get a trial without inflammation, these are the patients that surgically their stem cells or flaps might be a good option. Steve, any other reasonable options other than infliximab combo therapy? Well, everything is reasonable, but you ask what's the most effective or the, the data that we have from the most effective in this situation that we provided. Right, so A was your top, but B would, how about infliximab I mean, monotherapy? We, we can talk about a lot of other, everything else is a less of a, a choice unless there's a compelling reason. Anything that reduces bowel frequency and solidifies the stool and uh, heals the rectum may improve the fistula output, but we don't have anything else that actually, quote, heals the fistula. So no other biologics um, stand out other than infliximab combo therapy? We don't have primary data on them. We have secondary analyses. And uh, I would urge you all to come to Millie Long's talk on the, the fallacy of these uh, post hoc analyses as they translate into prospective studies. And while I agree with Steve, if you were stuck and you couldn't use an anti-TNF or that had been exhausted, I think it would be reasonable to try use sakimumab. Uh, Vitalizumab, again, these are all post hoc, but if you're stuck as a second option, I think that'd be reasonable for the reasons Steve said if there's inflammation. But, but other anti-TNFs other than infliximab are reasonable. Correct. Okay, yeah. so let's go to case number two. 44 year old male has moderate severe ulcerative colitis and active rheumatoid arthritis. He's given infliximab as a primary non responder, levels 23, has a trough, no antibodies, only has those two conditions, is already on methotrexate 10 milligrams, and on exam, he has evidence of, of abdominal inflammation or pain and has active RA. Miguel, what's your top choice for this individual? So you're making this pretty easy, but I would do monotherapy, tofacitinib, and I would stop the methotrexate. Steve, any changes for your top choice? No changes, but just of interest, the uh, rheumatologists are allowed to use methotrexate in conjunction with five milligrams twice daily of um, tofacitinib. So, you know, we, we've imposed some of our own restrictions by the entry criteria in these studies. Okay, and let's say you, you can't get tofacitinib. What are we, it's another reasonable option, Miguel? I would say use sakimumab, and I would continue the methotrexate initially because he's on it, but you could make the argument for monotherapy use of kimumab based on the recent data. Steve, anything else to say uh, with that? Probably one? the same, yes. And what about um, uh, one of the IL-17 blockers? No, those are harmful in ulcerative colitis. Those are harmful, so that's so why the commercial Probably say not. And, and to be fair, Balance, you could certainly use vitalizumab in this if you didn't have the RA up there in bold letters. I'd right. probably say uh, vetalizumab would also be reasonable. Okay, case number three. 39-year-old <clears throat> female, moderate severe Crohn's disease, and now she has MS diagnosed. She initially failed methotrexate for her Crohn's, um, went into remission when she added adalimumab, but then she was diagnosed with new MS. The adalimumab was stopped 
the MS did not resolve. It turned out she really truly has MS and not just uh, a transient um, uh, demyelinization. She only has Crohn's and now MS as a diagnosis. She's still on 25 of methotrexate and folic acid. Her physical examination is okay other than her MS traits. And you've sent but not yet received the JC virus level. Miguel, top <laughs> choice. And then you can tell me with or without the JC virus an answers. You know, if she's JC virus negative, I think that natalizumab would actually be a very good uh, first choice. If she's JC virus positive, you could still also make that argument, but I'd probably shy away from natalizumab. And then in this case, anti-TNFs, whether the MS was related to the adalibumab, probably not. Um, but I wouldn't go back to another anti-TNF based on the demyelinating uh, potential, and I would use uh, use sikimumab in this patient or vetalizumab. I guess I would go back and forth uh, between the two. Steve, I think either are reasonable options. We don't have a good way of differentiating those between those two. Does so, anybody, do you guys use natalizumab anymore? Would you yes. use it in this patient? Yes. Right. Uh, so, maybe not the newly diagnosed MS because I think it's more for relapsing, remitting, yeah, but it's rather reasonable. than new. But yeah. I think that, uh, you know, natalizumab was a, a good drug in Crohn's disease and safe in every other way aside from the uh, PML, PML, which is obviously not acceptable. What about if, there were, if, the, if the neurologist asks you about one of the fingolimod or what, uh, fingolimod, which is currently available? I think that I think that would be a very actually I think that would be a very reasonable choice. Right. So if you were to treat the MS first, I would say that that's uh, that would be a very reasonable option. Yes. So Steve, why um, would we not prescribe fingolimod, but we would like the neurologist to do so? What other medicine are we thinking about that's coming down the pipeline? Well, uh, there are a number of other mods, uh, ozanamod and atrezomod, that are. Uh, undergoing clinical trials, fingolimod is approved for the treatment of multiple sclerosis, and uh, you saw some of the data from the phase twos that Miguel demonstrated that there is uh, promise with that, but it's not yet approved for Crohn's disease, and I think that um, we would let the neurologist prescribe it and monitor the Crohn's. Right, but I believe we're hoping they're going to have ozonamide for MS sometime next year. Right. Okay, case number four. 39-year-old female with moderate to severe Crohn's, colitis, and newly diagnosed psoriasis of her scalp, palms, and soles. She was doing great with her Crohn's on adalimumab in remission, but then she developed psoriasis, and despite all the creams and lozenges and lozenges and things that the dermatologist can throw at her, it's still persistent. She only has Crohn's and now the psoriasis. She's on adalimumab, 40 milligrams every 14 days. Her level is 6.0, and she's on methotrexate. Now, 15 milligrams every other week, and she still has the refractory psoriasis. Steve, what are you going to do? Well, it's a slow pitch. Uh, it's obviously for ustekinumab in this situation, which is approved for the treatment of psoriasis and has been a go-to agent for the patient, the uncommon patients who have developed psoriasis while on TNF inhibitors. Miguel, what if ustekinumab is not available? Um, so if usikimumab is not available, it's probably an anti-TNF-induced psoriasis, so I wouldn't personally go to another. Um, you could make the argument that you could try infliximab, but the crossover is about 50%. And when you have this on your scalp, palms, and soles, this is more severe. So if usikimumab were not available for Crohn's, I would go to vetalizumab now. Um, I'd decide whether or not to continue methotrexate for psoriasis, but the psoriasis will probably get better just by stopping the anti-TNF. Steve, there was some And data. I think, you know, okay. again, I agree with uh, Miguel, but there are a couple other TNF inhibitors that can be substituted, sertiluzumab or um, galumumab, uh, could be, subst well, galumumab for ulcerative colitis, sertiluzumab for Crohn's disease here uh, that could be substituted. And sometimes you see that psoriasis go away with the second TNF. What about decreasing the dose of adalimumab? It was initially we were told to consider doing that. Well, Why not? You're now, now you're beyond, you know, when you're talking about going to monthly uh, adalimumab, it's below the uh, recommended dosing. So 
and the trough level is, or yeah. the level is six. Yeah, so and I think the, what you're getting at, which is important maybe for the group if they hadn't heard this, initially we thought the story was going to be that the too high of doses of anti-TNF were causing psoriasis, and all we had to do is lower it. With her level being six as well, that's probably not reasonable. Interesting question I created. Okay, so case number five. Although, how does lozenges help psoriasis? <laughs> I was just thinking people were paying attention. I put some lo lozenges on the, on the food thing. They, I told people they were M&Ms. So, 75-year-old diabetic uh, on insulin, hypertension, mild congestive heart failure, and has developed what has been initially described as this sigmoid, isolated sigmoid colitis that many of us are plagued with, or hopefully not personally. Colonoscopy, normal ileum, above the sigmoid and below the um, sigmoid, things are fine, but the sigmoid colon is inflamed with diverticulum, stellate ulceration, so not just red stuff around the diverticulum, and the biopsies, as usual, the pathologist says, well, could be IBD, it could be diverticular colitis, but specifically, you really would not call it ischemic. Um, oral mesalamine and rectal mesalamine, partially effective. Tried hydrocortisone enemas, but the, their diabetes went out of control, even just with the enemas. Um, and on physical exam, the only positive things are tenderness by the left lower quadrant and some mild pedal edema as they have some mild CHF. I think, who is it? Miguel, your turn first? Sure. What are you going to do? So I think, you know, so one thing you're leading us down the path is this is a segmental colitis associated with diverticulosis. And even though the way you mentioned the ulcers, I still think that's possibly in the, the realm, although it's looking more like Crohn's. Um, if she had very severe, or he had very severe segmental disease, although there are some comorbidities, a resection would be reasonable. But I think what you're probably getting at, one thing I'll tell you is, and I might be one of the few people that do this, I still like sulfasalazine, so I'd be tempted to try a different 5-ASA mechanism, but vetalizumab in terms of a biologic with somebody with heart failure, probably avoid anti-TNFs, although the mild heart failure is probably okay. Um, I think safety-wise, I'd go with Vito. I, I could argue ustichimumab would be reasonable, but I'd probably choose vetalizumab. I agree that I would operate on this guy and start with a clean slate and monitor him post-operatively. Patient doesn't want surgery. Any other options than vetalizumab? No, I, then I agree, uh, to, again, totally with Miguel. Sulfasalazine has historically been uh, used in this, if you read about SCAD, that, but um, I don't think it's going to be very effective. Anti-TNF therapy? It's Mild all CHF? reasonable. It's uh, everything is shared decision making. I recommended surgery. He didn't want surgery. Didn't want so surgery. He, so he so he can die from pneumonia. Miguel, <laughs> usikinumab versus vedolizumab. Tough one. So so one thing I wouldn't give D, you're probably not, and why I would not give lozenges for this patient. Um, so I would, you know, again, you're going to be splitting hairs. I think that, honestly, either would be fine. I could not argue for one over the other. I guess from the purest of safety in the back of our mind, gut selectivity, vedolizumab would probably be what I would lean toward, knowing that it's also going to be sub-Q soon. Uh, that that's another, that would be reasonable, but I, I could not make an argument against you, Sakimia, ma'am. Okay, let's change the scenario a little bit then. 75-year-old male, diabetic, hypertension, mild CHF, but had a recent DVT with moderate to severe pan-UC. Colonoscopy, normal ileum, pan-ulcerative colitis, oral and enemas, mesalamine, oral budesonide, partially effective, hydrocortisone enemas, again, high blood sugars, diabetic, Physical examination has some uh, mild abdominal distension that he describes as gas and some mild pedal edema. He started on vetalizumab by Miguel, loaded, then given every eight week therapy, gets partial response. Miguel goes to every four weeks, and he still has moderately active pan ulcerative colitis on repeat colonoscopy. Steve, what's Miguel doing wrong? He didn't yeah. take the colon out. <laughs> so Steve would take the colon out as your top choice. Yeah. This is someone who's only tried vetalizumab and it hasn't worked. He's tried cortisone enemas. He has high sugars. It really depends. If he's, symptom if he's highly symptomatic, um, then I would take his colon out. I'm not going to, you know, my, I'm a proponent of health, okay? And that's the way he can get back to be he as healthy as he could. Okay, Miguel, what if the person doesn't want to have their colon taken out right now and they've only had vetalizumab? Then he can go on a TNF and get a pneumonia. <laughs> 
Wow, see a theme here. Um, I agree with Steve. I would, I would do a subtotal colectomy and ileostomy, but I know where you're going with this, Russ. So, and, and you've already uh, bashed my vitalizumab escalation, although I'm not sure why you kept saying I did that and it's my fault. But nonetheless, thank you for that. So I think what we're, so what are we left with? We're left with ustekimumab, tofacitinib, and we're left with an anti-TNF. I think over the age of 60, 75 with comorbidities, I'd probably lean away from anti-TNF. And although Steve keeps saying it, it is true that pneumococcal pneumonia is still the leading cause of morbidity and mortality, and anti-TNF probably would not be what I would go to. So in this case, I would come down between uh, Tofa and Ustekimumab. Tofa, in my mind, is off the table because they, he's had a recent DVT. I will say that once a patient gets a DVT from their UC, I put them into a different risk category and I really push surgery. But then what are we left with is Ustekimumab, and that's what I would give next if they're refusing all other medicine, all surgery. Okay. Case number seven, 25-year-old male, healthy, only has left-sided ulcerative colitis, colonoscopy, normal ileum, left-sided UC, oral mesalamine and oral budesonide, partially affected. He says he refuses to take therapies, quote, up my butt, unquote. He also has, quote, needle phobia, unquote, and wants to take pills. He was given IV infliximab while he kept his eyes closed during the IV infusion. It worked, but he developed a lupoid or lupus-like reaction, um, and, uh, and which, was, which resolved when it stopped. Otherwise, normal examination. Steve, what is your top choice for this guy? Well, again, you're giving a little bit of a slow pitch. This would be a case for tofacitinib, a situation where that would be a very reasonable therapy for him. Miguel? I totally agree. And I think, um, you know, I like tofa. I think it would work well. I think the question will come, do you lower the dose at some point and when? But I would give him tofacitinib. Okay, so let's say I change this to a female who has the same thing, doesn't want to take things up her butt, or has needlephobia, but she just got married and wants to get pregnant today. Okay, exact same scenario, wants to get pregnant. Steve, you're still going to lead with Tofa? Uh, no, this is, you know, you're going to lay out her options, uh, and uh, even though she doesn't uh, like needles, uh, the effective therapies are going to be needle therapy for her and she's probably a good candidate for uh, vetaluzumab. Miguel, any, ch any changes? No, I agree. Or right, usikimumab would be fine as well, both safe in pregnancy. So the vetaluzumab because it's IV and she doesn't give herself shots, and usikimumab because then you can drag her in every eight weeks and have your nurse give her a shot where her eyes are closed, right? <laughs> yes. Okay. No, the, uh, the nurse should keep her eyes open. The patient should close them. Thank you very much for your attendance. I want to point out what zero, zero, zero.